As we start off chapter two, you're going to notice there's two, two sections we're going to be covering. The first one is section 2.1, which we will cover in two days. It's called Describing Location in a Distribution. And then we'll wrap up uh, the chapter with section 2.2, which is Normal Distributions. And we'll cover that in three days. So let's go ahead and get started with the notes. As we focus on describing locations within a distribution, we want to come away with the notes from today being able to use percentiles to locate individual values within a distribution of data, also interpret a cumulative relative frequency graph, and the last thing you may not have heard of, but it's not overly difficult, is find a standardized value or a z-score of an observation. In terms of vocabulary, we're going to cover four vocab words, uh, percentile, cumulative relative frequency graph, standardizing, and standardized value, which is a z-score. The first vocab word we're going to talk about is percentiles. And the key about percentiles, it all deals with position that data is in. You're probably very familiar with on the ACT, you get a percentile ranking. The SAT has a percentile ranking. A lot of the national standardized tests have percentile rankings. And it's all about your position in ranked data. Uh, the formal definition is right here. It's the pth percentile of a distribution is the value with p percent of the observations less than it. So for example, if I'm trying to find um, the 50th percentile, it's how many people are less than 50 percent. It does not include that actual percentage itself. Let's look at an example. Here it says Jenny earned a score of 86 on her test. How did she perform relative to the rest of the class? If you count the number of leaves on this stem and leaf plot, you're going to see that there's 25 pieces of data. Uh, so 25 students took this test. And if you count how many students are beneath her, you see that in the red here, there's actually 21 students beneath her. So you can figure out what percentile ranking Jenny has. Just take the 21 over 25 times that by 100, and you're going to get that she is at the 84th percentile ranking with amongst the students in her class. You know, clearly another way you could look at it is realize of the 25 students, including herself and this other above her, there's four of them. Uh, if you do four out of 25, you're going to get 16%, and you can just subtract that from 100 and get the 84th percentile. So let's take a look in our note packet. Uh, this is still on page three, the Major League Baseball example. This stem plot here shows the number of wins for each of the 30 Major League Baseball teams in 2009. Um, if we notice the key here, uh, for example, 59 represents the number of wins. What they want us to find uh, for the percentiles for the following team for A, B, and C. Uh, I'm going to suggest right now that you pause this video look at letter A, um, the Colorado Rockies, who won 92 games, find their percentile ranking. So pause the video, and when you turn it back on, uh, you will see the correct answer. So go ahead and pause. Hopefully you realize that the number 92 in the stem plot is up in this upper region. Um, there are therefore 24 pieces of data below that, so you just do your percent. And the Colorado Rockies are in the 80th percentile ranking with respect to the other uh, 2009 Major League Baseball teams. Now if we continue on and look at the New York Yankees, New York Yankees are the top team here with 103, uh, therefore there's 29 teams below them, so 29 out of 30. When you do that on the calculator, you're going to get .9666 repeating. For percentiles, you want to round to the nearest integer so they are going to be at the 97th percentile. The last type of example is here, Part C, with the Kansas City Royals and Cleveland Indians. They both got 65 games, which is right here in our stem plot. And to do that, what you want to do is group all of your common ones together. So we have two 65s, and then count how many are beneath both of those. We have three pieces of data, so the 3 out of 30 is going to give us a clear integer, so they are in the 10th percentile. 
Now the next vocabulary word we're going to address is the cumulative relative frequency graph. And what this type of graph does is it displays the cumulative relative frequency of each class of the frequency distribution. Well, let's just break that down to something we've done before. Um, here we have the age of the first 44 presidents when they are inaugurated. So we have the standard frequency right here in their age groups or age classes. Um, what they've done in this next column right here is they found the cumulative frequency. Uh, cumulative frequency would be as of that point on downward. So for example, to get the cumulative frequency right here of 34, you would say it is read as how many presidents were 55, 59 years or younger. So what they've done is they've just tallied everything up up into the age of 59. That's where 34. You get the 41 because that's ages 64 and lower. So you add on the other 7, it gives us the 41. Now remember the word relative, that just means a percent. So all you need to do is take the percent of normal frequency for this. Um, if we already know that this should tally up to 44, so just take the 2 over 44 and change that to a percent for those. And then for the cumulative relative frequency, again, relative is just an indicator to do a percent. Just do a percent of the cumulative frequency. So all we're going to be doing is using uh, the cumulative frequency as our numerator. Still use 44 as a denominator. Now what they're doing in the graph at the right is they are actually graphing the cumulative uh, relative frequency here in terms of our percents. You're going to notice some key things. The last ordered pair is 100% because we're accumulating all of the percents so we need to get to the whole. And that's what we're seeing right here at 100%. So all of the presidents were 79 years of age or younger, includes everybody. Also notice on this graph some of the changes between points. Notice that from this point to this how steep that is. Just recognize between the ages of 50 and 55 what caused the steepness. Um, if you take a look at that, it's this piece of data right here. Between 50 and 55, we added 13 more presidents to the list. It was the largest jump in the age classes that we're seeing. Therefore, you see the steepness of the graph actually climb and become the steepest in all of the intervals on this cumulative relative frequency graph. You know, you could say the converse to that, this is right here, the smallest change would be a frequency of 2. And if you notice between 40 and 45, it is less steep, so you see less of growth within the graph on that interval. You know, how do we use these graph to answer some questions? Here's two good questions we're going to look at. The first one is here, was Barack Obama, who was inaugurated at age 47, unusually young? Well, look at age 47 in the graph, find where it hits on the line, and just go over here, and you're going to realize he was inaugurated um, when in the percentile, is he's in the 11th percentile. So was he unusually young? Well, it, this could be interpreted by saying about 11% of all U.S. presidents were younger than Barack Obama when they were inaugurated. Or you could flip it and say that President Obama was inaugurated at a younger age than about 89% of all of the U.S. presidents. Now the second problem looks at estimate and interpret the 65th percentile of the distribution. So find the percentile where it hits the graph and realize it coordinates with the age of 58. And then to interpret this, we could say about 65% of all U.S. presidents were younger than 55 when they took office. Well, let's go to page 4 in your note packet and just do another example with cumulative relative frequency graphs. Here we have the state median household incomes. Uh, here's a cumulative relative frequency graph showing the distribution of median household incomes for the 50 states and District of Columbia. So in Part A, they want us to look at California, who has a median income of 57,445, determine what percentile they are in, and then interpret this value. So if we look up that household income level, is roughly going to be about right here, 
And if we go to the graph and just go straight up and then go over to the corresponding percentile, we will find here that it's roughly about 80%. Uh, the book would actually say that this is a 0.79, so it's at the cumulative relative frequency of 79%. Uh, so we would say the 79th percentile. And to interpret that, what we could say that approximately 79% of the 50 states and District Columbia have a median income less than that of the state of California. Part B wants us to find what is the 25th percentile for this distribution and what's another name for that value. Well, remember in the box plots, five number summaries from Chapter 1, a number na another name for that value is quartile 1, by the way, which comes from the box plot and five number summary. Uh, what is the 25th percentile for the distribution? Go ahead and find about 25%. Go over and come down. And we're going to notice it's roughly at about $45,000. This could be interpreted as saying about 25% of the states have a median income less than $45,000. And the last part of this question is asking, where is the graph the steepest? What does this indicate about the distribution? I would say it looks like the graph is probably the steepest between $45,000 and $50,000 for the median income. And what that indicates about the distribution is that there are a lot of states that have the median income between forty-five and fifty thousand dollars. Which then caused the cumulative frequency itself to increase at a higher rate, which you're seeing in the larger cumulative relative frequency, which deals with rates and percents. Now the next vocab word we're going to talk about is standardization and z-scores. They go together. Um, and what we're doing here is we're measuring position, but we're going to compute the z-score so that we can compare our position or our performance on maybe a science test to an algebra test. Uh, these two types of exams aren't apples to apples, as we would say. This is more apples to oranges, and I want to standardize them. So here's what we do is a z-score tells us how many standard deviations from the mean an observation falls. And it'll tell us which direction based on if it's a positive or a negative sign. Um, here it says in the definition part, if x is an observation from a distribution that has a known mean and standard deviation, then the standardized value of x is this z-score computation. What you do is you take, if we're talking about a test, we would take your test score minus the mean of that class or that group, and divide by the standard deviation. Um, this will give us a z-score. We can do that, for example, an algebra test and do it with a science test, and we can make them comparable, um, assuming that they were the same groups of students participating in the test. Let me show you how it works. Here we have Jenny. She earned her score of 86 on her test. Um, now what we need to know is the class mean. Uh, the mean was 80 points. The standard deviation was 6.07 points. That means, by the way, on average, uh, the students deviated above or below the class average by 6.07 points. What's her standardized score? It's as simple as this, folks. Just take her test score minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. And her z-score is 0.99. To interpret that, this is what it means. This is how many standard deviations that Jenny is from the class mean. She is almost one standard deviation above the class mean. Well, that make, should make sense. The mean was 80 points. The standard deviation is 6. You add 6 to 80, you get about 86, which is um, basically her test score. She's almost one full standard deviation. She's above the class mean. It's a positive score. She should be happy that it's positive and not negative. 
If it were a negative score, this value, her 86, would have to be lower than the 80, which would mean she did more poorly than the rest of the class. The main reason we have z-scores is not to say how did we do on one particular test, but again to compare. So let's look at this. Jenny earned her 86 on her stats test. The class mean was 80, standard deviation 6.07. We have that right here. That's her z-score on her stats test. Now she earned an, 80, an 82 on her chem test. Um, the distribution was fairly symmetric, which is good. The mean of that test was 76 points, standard deviation of 4. On which test did Jenny perform better relative to the rest of her class? If you compute the z-score on here, she is actually 1.5 standard deviations above the class average. So relative to the rest of the students in her class, and let's assume in this case that both classes of students um, were the same students and it's much more comparable, um, Jenny did better on her chemistry test. Let's just highlight a few things about a z-score. How do you calculate and interpret the z-score? Well, we have the calculation, right? The z-score is x minus, if we want to say, uh, sometimes they'll do x-bar, which is the mean of the sample, over the standard deviation of the sample. Again, we talked earlier in notes. Remember, standard deviation is a measure of spread. And what standard deviation means, which is this right here, it's the average distance observations are from the mean. So that's what we're looking at is how many standard deviations a person is or a piece of data is from the mean of that data. Um, this is what I talked about, apples to oranges. We can't compare, again, Jenny's chem test and her stats test until we standardize those. A z-score is going to be very essential to the rest of what we're going to be doing in statistics. We will be using that to figure out exactly the number of standard deviations we are from the mean. The sign of a z-score can either be positive or it can be negative. Um, and the context all differs. If we're talking about a test score, maybe for um, AP stats, I'm hoping I have a positive z-score. I'm hoping I deviate above the class average versus negative. If I'm talking about running in cross country, I'm hoping my z-score for running is negative in relation to the average time run by my team. I would love to be faster than them and so have a negative z-score. So again, it's all in the context if the sign is good to be positive or negative. And does a z-score have units? You know, we were talking before about Jenny's tests. We don't say that her z-score is 0.99 points. What it is, it does have units, but the units are... Um, the standard deviations above or below the average. And probably just say standard deviations from the average would actually be the, the unit of measure for that. You would not put on there, again, if we're talking about time, minutes, or test scores in terms of your score. Okay, I'm going to challenge you to take a look at this example. Not meant to be overly difficult. Uh, we have an SAT-ACT exam. Uh, Jenny scored on her exam and Gerald scored on her exam. Um, we're going to compare the SAT to the ACT. I want you to take a moment and determine, based on z-scores, who performed better on their two standardized tests. So pause the video, compute the z-scores. When you turn the video back on, you'll see the z-score calculations. Based on the calculations, you should have noted that Jeannie performed better on her SAT exams verbal section as compared to Gerald on her verbal portion of the ACT. Um, you know, let's look at another example. Let's go back to the Major League Baseball information. Uh, we had our 2009 um, wins from before. The mean number of wins for these baseball teams is 81. The standard deviation is 11.4 wins. So on average, the teams deviate high, above, or below the mean by 11.4 wins. Uh, find and interpret the z-scores. So the New York Yankees z-score, if we interpret that, um, let's calculate it out. We can interpret the z-score you get for the New York Yankees is 1.93. You would say the New York Yankees are 1.93 standard deviations above the mean uh, 
the mean of 81 wins. Okay. The New York Mets, they had 70 wins. Let's compute theirs. I'm going to pause the video and do that real quickly. Here's what you could get for that. The Z-score for the New York Mets is negative 0.096. That would be interpreted as they are 0.96 standard deviations below the average number of wins in baseball in 2009. So this right here, folks, is putting it in context, giving some meaning to the numerical answer. Now I want you to look at on the notes on page 6, and notice I have two more examples. Read them, and if you want the information, go ahead and listen. If not, fast forward because we're pretty much done with notes. But let's look at these other two examples if you want to. Here we go. Home Run Kings is called. The single season home run record for Major League Baseball has been set just three times since Babe Ruth hit 60 home runs in 1927. Roger Maris hit 61 in 1961. Mark McGuire hit 70 in 1998. And Barry Bonds hit 73 in 2001. In an absolute sense, Barry Bonds had the best performance of these per, uh, players since he hit the most runs in terms of frequency right here. However, in relative sense, this may not be true. Baseball historians suggest that hitting a home run has been easier in some eras than others. This is due to many factors, including the quality of the batters, quality of pitchers, hardness of the baseball, dimensions of the ballparks, and possible use of performance-enhancing drugs. As we know with Mark McGuire, I think, I believe his records, if they were made, they were expunged and he can't hold his records anymore because of drug use says here, to make a fair comparison, we should see how these performances rate relative to other hitters during the same year. So what we need to do is calculate the standard score for each player and compare them. I'm going to pause the video and get the z-scores up here on the screen. So if you want to practice it, pause it and see if you can do that. And we'll see what you got. If you notice the four z-score calculations, again they said Barry Bonds by counter frequency clearly had the most home runs. But we, when we adjust for it, we see that the clear winner in this, in this term is Babe Ruth. He is 5.44 standard deviations above the average number of home runs hit in baseball back in 1927. Now the last part of this says in 2001, Arizona Diamondback Mark Grace's home run total had a standardized score of negative .48. Interpret this value and calculate the number of home runs he actually hit. We could interpret this value that he is .48 standard deviations below the average number of home runs of 21.4 back in 2001. Now the last thing they want us to do here is to calculate how many home runs he hit. So let's just go backwards. The z-score calculation is your piece of data minus the mean over standard deviation. So his z-score is negative 0.48. I'm not sure what he hit. The mean in 2001 was 21.4. Standard deviation was 13.2. If we do the algebra on that, what you're going to want to do is to multiply the both sides by 13.2. That's going to give us the 6.336. And then just finish up by adding the 21.4 to both sides. And I, be careful, this would have been a negative. So with that, we're going to see that he had about 15 home runs in 2001. This next one is a good question in terms of the context. We have a track example. Competitors A, B, and C are competing in a decathlon. After three events, who turned in the most remarkable performance in the competition? What you need to do for this problem is compute three Z scores for each competitor. For competitor A, then we're going to have B, and then C. And then look at the results for that. I'm going to pause the video for a moment here, get the z-scores on the screen, we'll look at the z-scores, and then make a decision. So go ahead and pause if you want to try this one. 
So here are the results that we have for competitor A, B, and C. Now I want to go through and just circle who we said did best in each activity, by the way. Um, if we are looking at the dash, we're doing the 100-yard dash. In the 100-yard dash, you actually want to have be fast, so you want a negative z-score. So B did the best on that, a negative z-score. The shot put, we want to throw as far as we can. So competitor uh, A did the best on that one. And then the long jump, we want to go as far as we can, so this would be first place. Now I'm going to go ahead and just actually do second place with the red. So our second place here would be this person for the dash, uh, for the shot put, second place, and for the long jump, second place. And then third place, just this color. So if you take a look at it in terms of each competitor, each competitor of mine, if you look at A, B, and C, each have a different color. So they've all either placed first, second, or third in each event. Um, so you might want to look at the magnitude of their deviations. And, you know, it really it varies on here. It looks like to me, if you had to make an argument, the shot put is a whole one de standard deviation above. This is 2.5. He did not do well on the dash here. So it's kind of relative in terms of uh, they, they're each getting first place for each of the one of the events. I would be tempted to argue that competitor C is probably the best competitor on here because on two of the events, he is a, a nice amount of standard deviations above, which is where we want to be. We do have an issue, though, with his, with his dash and that he was not as fast as the average runners. So hopefully you're coming away from these notes and we've done enough examples on finding the percentiles. Remember, it's the amount below interpreting the cumulative relative frequency graph, and finding standardized z-scores and interpreting them in context. Now, now, in a flipped classroom, taking the notes, what you're doing right now is your homework. So technically, you're done with your homework. Um, tomorrow when we come to class, I'll give you work time, and you can work on sections 2.1 homework as listed in the packet. Feel free to get started if you'd like. Um, we will have another video ready for you to listen to tomorrow night as we wrap up section 2.1.